Did you ever read the fine print that appears when you start browsing in incognito mode? It says that your activity might still be visible to your employer, your school, or your internet service provider. How can they even call it incognito? To really stop people from seeing the sites you visit, you need to do what I do and use ExpressVPN. Think about all the times you've used Wi-Fi at a coffee shop, a hotel, or even at your parents' house. Without ExpressVPN, every site you visit could be logged by the admin of that network. And that's still true, even when you're in cognito mode. I mean, do you really want your parents to see what you've been looking at? What's more, your home internet provider can also see and record your browsing data. And in the U.S., they're legally allowed to sell that data to advertisers. ExpressVPN is an app that encrypts all your network data and reroutes it through a network of secure servers so that your private online activity stays just that, private. ExpressVPN works on all your devices and is super easy to use. The app literally has one button. You tap to connect and your browsing activity is secure from prying eyes. So stop letting strangers invade your online privacy. Protect yourself at expressvpn.com slash ratchet. Use my link at expressvpn.com slash ratchet to get three extra months free. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash ratchet to learn more. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and those who don't identify as either, you are listening to Ratchet and Respectable with Demetria L. Lucas. I'm coming to you not so live, because I am actually going to edit this episode, but I'm currently in Sao Tome. If you're a regular listener, you know I've been talking about this place for the last couple months. It's this teeny tiny island two hours off the coast of Ghana with Portuguese-speaking black folk. I got in about three, maybe four now, four hours ago, and it's the sun sets really early here. I got in probably at like 5.30 and the sun was already going down. So I didn't get a chance to go out and explore the city today, but it's really beautiful. The part that I did see from the air, it's absolutely gorgeous here. It kind of reminds me of St. Thomas, and that's just seeing it from the air and like the ride from the airport to the hotel, which wasn't very far from the airport. So I reserve the right to change my mind about that description come tomorrow when I get a chance to walk around. But the part that I did see so far is really, really beautiful. I'm staying at this very cute hotel on the island. I just came back from dinner where I was the only black person in the restaurant that wasn't working on the property in Africa. I'm still in Africa. I'm off the coast of Africa, but I'm still in Africa. That that's that's interesting. I point it out for two reasons. One, because I'm in Africa surrounded by white people. And then two, I'm having a ball here. I'm absolutely loving my life nearly every day is at a 10. Like it never really drops lower than an eight, even on a bad day. I just feel very sometimes lied to. It's not even feel, it's a fact. I was lied to about what Africa is because the images of Africa that I grew up seeing and, and the way that people used to speak about Africa when I was coming up, it made it sound I don't need to give you a description of the negative because you've all heard it the same way I did. But it's like you told me that Africa was all of these terrible things. And at the same time, white people were telling us that shit. They were coming over here, living it the fuck up. People out here living their best lives in these like big ass houses and these gorgeous hotels going on all these sightseeing adventures, just seeing all this beautiful, epic shit. Buying up property, opening businesses. Meanwhile, they were telling us, black people, that over in Africa was trash. And there was nothing there for them. We we should be thankful that they they took our ancestors out of there and we got a better life because of it. It's, ah, I'm very thankful to be here. But I'm also like, I just, I was lied to. We all were. Sometimes it just hits me and just, it's very aggravating, frustrating, anger. Put a name on it. It's okay to be angry, especially when you have like a rightful reason to be. But I'm just like, are you like kidding me? It's crazy. It's not crazy. It's fucked up. It's intentionally, purposely, willfully. It was a choice was made. It's fucked up. (sighs) Dinner was good though. 
I wanted to try the local cuisine. So, I mean, you can never really go wrong with like fish and plantains. It's locally seasoned. And I was like, whatever that means, sure. Because I trust black people with spices. And it was amazing. I'll post a picture of my fish on my stories. Um, I also had for dessert, which I usually don't do. I'm not a big dessert person. But they had peanut ice cream. I was like, what does peanut gelato taste like? Gelato, not ice cream. Slight difference, I think. I can't tell the difference, but apparently there is one. Peanut gelato tastes exactly like old black men who eat butter pecan. Butter pecan was my grandfather's favorite ice cream. I'm trying to think what the paper was on the outside. It wasn't cardboard, but it was some sort of like brown wrapping. And the carton that it came in was a big circle. And my grandfather would just like literally stick the spoon in in like the big circle of ice cream and just go to town. My grandfather's been gone for 20 years, almost 20 years. My early 20s when he passed away. I don't remember exactly what year. I don't remember exactly what year. I remember what I wore to his funeral, though, to his funeral. I wore one of his ties. I went through this phase where I was wearing shirts with ties. Think Dion and Cher and Clueless. Something about like that. I don't necessarily think about him on a regular basis. I think about my grandmother far more often than I think about him. I'm don't, not sure why. I spent equal amounts of time with both of them, but he just doesn't cross my mind the same way. But I was eating this peanut ice cream. Again, somewhere off the random coast, somewhere off the coast of Africa, like thousands and thousands and thousands of miles from Detroit. That's where my grandparents lived. And I felt like super connected to my grandfather for like the first time in years. Mm. Africa's full of surprises. I'll tell you that. Plenty of good black news this week. I saw the trailer for the new trailer for Wakanda Forever. I saw that it has a runtime of two hours and 40 minutes, which I was like, that's fine. I think that might mean that they're going to give me, me specifically, a proper mourning period for my king and then also a proper home going for my king. I was like, Aretha got eight hours. The queen of England, she, I, don't, I have no idea because I didn't watch any of that. I heard her funeral went on for a while. Is that accurate? Because I didn't watch not a bit of it, nor did I like read up on it. Like I just, I didn't care. It's sad that somebody's grandmother died, but it just as the figurehead of the queen of England, like I just, I didn't care. But I feel like my king needs ample runtime for his funeral. So I was like two hours and 40 minutes. If I was in America, I would buy a large popcorn with extra butter. But in Ghana, I think I'll be in Ghana when it comes out. I might be in Cote d'Ivoire. Wherever it is, I'm going to the theater. I hope they got English subtitles. I might be watching Black Panther in French or Wolof. I don't know. I don't know, but I'll be watching it. I'll follow along with the visuals if that's what it takes. But I will be going to see my king opening night. I'm so excited about this film. I mean, I think like most of the population. I saw people complain when the first trailer came out. It looks like this film is more focused on the women of Wakanda. And I saw people saying that, you know, it's emasculating. I think the vast majority of people are excited about it. I knew Curology was working for my skin when I started to get compliments from strangers on how clear my skin was. Before Curology, I had noticeable blemishes on my skin, but I've been using it for over a year now, and now my skin is completely clear. Curology is a game-changing custom skincare made for you by a dermatology provider. They'll create a custom prescription cream for your specific goals, whether that's tackling acne, clogged pores, skin texture, dark spots, fine lines, or something else. You start by taking a short online skin quiz and uploading photos. And if it's a good fit, they'll ship you your formula right to your door. It even has your name on the bottle. My Curology formula was specifically for my blemishes, and I started to notice a difference in my skin very quickly after using it. What I love most about Curology is I never run out of product. It's like as soon as my bottle gets low, another one arrives in the mail. So there's no break in my skincare treatment. Get started with Curology just like I did with a free 30-day trial at Curology.com slash ratchet. Just pay $5 for shipping and handling. That's C-U-R-O-L-O-G-Y dot com slash ratchet. To start your free 30-day trial, cancel anytime. Prescription subject to consultation. Did you ever read the fine print that appears when you start browsing in incognito mode? It says that your activity might still be visible to your employer, your school, or your internet service provider. 
How can they even call it incognito? To really stop people from seeing the sites you visit, you need to do what I do and use ExpressVPN. Think about all the times you've used Wi-Fi at a coffee shop, a hotel, or even at your parents' house. Without ExpressVPN, every site you visit could be logged by the admin of that network. And that's still true, even when you're in cognito mode. I mean, do you really want your parents to see what you've been looking at? What's more, your home internet provider can also see and record your browsing data. And in the U.S., they're legally allowed to sell that data to advertisers. ExpressVPN is an app that encrypts all your network data and reroutes it through a network of secure servers so that your private online activity stays just that, private. ExpressVPN works on all your devices and is super easy to use. The app literally has one button. You tap to connect and your browsing activity is secure from prying eyes. So stop letting strangers invade your online privacy. Protect yourself at expressvpn.com slash ratchet. Use my link at expressvpn.com slash ratchet to get three extra months free. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash ratchet to learn more. There's also a trailer for Will Smith's Emancipation, which I'm not in general an I told you so type chick. I say what I say and, and it, maybe it happens, maybe it doesn't. I'm right about a lot of things. I'm wrong about a lot of things. It, it happens. The Will Smith thing, I was right about. Right after Chris Rock made the joke about Nicole Brown Simpson, I don't even remember what the joke was, but people were so pissed about it. I, I don't know what Chris Rock was thinking. I'm like, you had the goodwill of the people and you just squandered it, squandered it. So as soon as that happened, everybody was like, oh, Where's Will Smith? Somebody come smack his ass again. Oh, Will Smith did a preemptive slap because Chris Rock had that shit coming. And then people started doing a, a, you know, composite list of all the fucked up and inappropriate things that Chris Rock has said over the years that somebody should have been slapped him for. And so people were like, we're not mad at Will no more. I said then this Will Smith film Emancipation has been sitting in the vault since the pre-slap. Nobody could figure out. Is Will persona non grata? Are people okay with Will? If we release this film, are people going to boycott it because Will Smith is the star of it? They couldn't figure out how people were feeling about Will Smith. As soon as Chris Rock said that shit and the backlash started towards Chris Rock, I was like, watch, Emancipation is going to get an air date before the end of the year. Emancipation got an air date earlier today. Apple released the trailer. The film will be in theaters, I think, December 2nd and on Apple TV, December 8th. I saw the trailer. It's black and white. I wasn't expecting that. I'd read about the film before. It's largely agreed upon that it would have been an Oscar contender if the incident that happened at the last Oscars hadn't occurred. You can't judge a film by the trailer, just like you can't judge a book by its cover. That said, the trailer looks freaking amazing. Will Smith doesn't look or sound like Will Smith. He looks transformed. The trailer is visually stunning. Antoine Fuqua is the director. Looks like he did a great job here. I am excited to see it. If the trailer is any indication of what the film is, Will Smith would probably have been nominated again. Maybe. I say that. But you know how like black people can be in really freaking amazing films and not get nominated for anything. Will Smith, even sans incident at the last Oscars, could have made an Oscar worthy film and not been nominated for it. That's entirely possible. I mean, we're talking about black folks in America. That said, it looks like when folks said this film could have been an Oscar contender, that they weren't exaggerating. I've heard that said about other films and then you finally see the film. What's that film with Jennifer Lopez where she was playing a a dancer, an exotic dancer? I remember there were conversations about Jennifer Lopez should be up for an Oscar based on that film. And I was like, really? Let me take a look. And then I saw the film and I was like, is it crack? Was it crack that you're smoking? I don't understand how they came up with that. I think Will Smith might have put up an Oscar worthy performance for this one. Maybe. I think it's worth mentioning, and I'm mentioning it on the back end for a reason. So this film is about an enslaved man 
whipped Peter. You know who he is, even if you don't know who he is. This image, I want to say it was 1863, 62, one of those during the Civil War. So Will Smith's film, Emancipation, is based on whipped Peter. You've seen this image. It's, it's a black man, formerly enslaved, and the focus of the image is his back. If I was Toni Morrison, I would call it a choke cherry tree because that's how Toni Morrison described a back that had been beaten, whipped to the point that the skin was broken so deep that when it healed, it keloided. You can see the whip marks in all these directions over the back of his skin. So this particular image of whipped Peter, his back had been, not his back, he had been brutally beaten and his back keloided from the whippings in a very jarring, harsh, tragic, sad, painful way. This is who Will Smith is portraying in this film. So I watched the trailer and I liked what I saw. I liked the transformation that I saw with Will Smith. There is a teensy part of me, what well, started off teensy, and the more conversations I have about it is growing and growing and growing, that doesn't like, one, another slave movie. I'm slave movied out. I don't think we've had one in a while, which thank you. We've had, I think, more empowering narratives over the last couple years, which thank you. That I, I, I appreciate the direction that we were going in. I've seen enough movies of, of enslaved black people. I think it's an important time in our history. I don't think it's something that, that black people should be ashamed of. I don't think we should pretend slavery didn't exist. But I just think that America is, is just got this weird obsession with seeing black people in, in tragedy and in turmoil and bondage and downtrodden, submissive, oppressed. I just, I just don't want to see that shit. Unless it's something like Django, where it's like a, re a revenge fantasy as written by a white guy. Django has its own separate situation. Nat Turner, I was actually fine with like a black guy goes ham and just burns up a bunch of white folks in revenge. I, that didn't bother me. I, I think I cheered during that film. I could see more like that, but this Whit Peter thing, I'm not sure about. I'm going to go see it. I'm measuring my words because I don't want to make the same mistake that a lot of people made with Woman King, where you think the film is one thing and it turns out to be something else because people are all like, they're going to whitewash the Dahomey tribe who sold Africans and that's an important part of the narrative and they're going to leave it out. And then it was literally like the crux of the plot of the whole film. The film is literally about the conflict of what to do over Africans selling other Africans into slavery. Without knowing what this Whit Peter story is, I just, I'm a little nervous. I'll say that. I did see that there was a screening for the film in DC during CBC. You know, I used to go to CBC like every year pre-COVID. I haven't had FOMO about anything going on in the States since I've been over here. That was the first time. Seeing all my friends together and posting all their, their pictures and videos from CBC, like everyone was there without me. And they were texting me, sending me videos from the events. And I was like, I love y'all. I love y'all. I kind of hate y'all, but I love y'all. My dad called me and was like, yeah, I ran into this person. I ran into that person. And I told you my friends in DC like do this thing like when they see my dad. It's like they play Where's Waldo. They take selfies with my dad and then send them to me. But there was a screening of Emancipation at CBC with Will Smith and Antoine Fuqua. And Will had some interesting insights about the film. And I think it's worth sharing. Maybe other people might have the same trepidation about the film, particularly it being a film about an enslaved person that I do. This is being quoted in The Hollywood Reporter. Quote, Throughout my career, I've turned down many films that were set in slavery. I never wanted to show us like that. And then this picture came along. And this is not a film about slavery. This is a film about freedom. This is a film about resilience. This is a film about faith. He continued, this is a film about the heart of a man, what could be called the first viral image. 
Cameras had just been created and the image of Whip Peter went around the world. It was a rallying cry against slavery. And this was a story that exploded and blossomed in my heart that I only wanted to be able to deliver to you in a way that only Antoine Fuqua, director, could deliver. This is Smith still. And I'm quoting this one from Shadow and Act. He said, when I read the script, it was a movie that when I read it, I thought, of course, it's about slavery, about the brutality of slavery and the forced labor of slavery. But it was also a beautiful love story and the love story about our people and about faith. It was so powerful for me that I removed it from just being a slave film as I imagined it. And I wanted to make a film about faith. I wanted to make a film about love, about family, because the reality and the harshness that needed to be shown had to be centered in a positive place. This is what Antoine Fuqua, the director, had to say. And I'm telling you all this for a reason, because I'm about to say something else after this. I want to make sure that I'm presenting the perspective of the creators. I think that's important. Fuqua said, quote, I've always felt like a lot of times films are made about slavery, that they're like Hallmark cards like people singing hymns and the romanticism that goes with it sometimes. This is not that. This doesn't shy away from brutality, nor it doesn't minimize brutality and the reality of it. And there's a strong character to center. It's hard to make a film about the subject matter that's inspiring. But the scorched back of Peter, the actual photo, it inspired. It was a rallying cry against slavery. And here we are making a film about it today. That's what Will's character, Peter, is about. So I don't think people go to see a movie about slaves to walk out feeling inspired. I hope they will on this one. I think it's important to tell black stories. I don't think they always have to be pretty stories. I don't think they always have to be uplifting stories. I just think that there have been an abundance of stories about enslaved black people. And there's more to our story than we were enslaved. Yes, that happened. But there were other stories in addition to that. Like, it's just very weird, um, the focus on this one particular, I mean, and it was a long time period, in fairness. It was a good 1619 to 1865. There was a long span of time. America is a young country with a short history, and slavery took up, shit, more than half of it. I do see that, you know, timeline-wise, we're talking about black people in America, a good chunk of it, black folks were in bondage. And still I say, there are other stories. Can we tell like an abundance of, I don't know, black inventor stories or an abundance of black rom-coms or an abundance of, I don't know, black people, the roller skating rink. Cause white people get movies about like just random shit. Like, oh, they work at a convenience store. Like, oh, it's white people went to Vegas. We have an abundance of slave movies, but I still don't have a black eat, pray, love. That's why it bothers me. The other part of this, and I must note that Emancipation was filmed and completed before the Oscars. If you remember when Will Smith was on the cover of, I think it was easily Esquire or GQ. He didn't have a mustache, but he had a beard. I think that's from around the time when he was shooting Emancipation, because that's what his facial hair looks like in the film and in the the promo art for the film. So it's not like the Oscars happened and Will Smith is persona non grata, mostly for white folks. I think black people were like, yeah, that's fucked up, but you know, we still gonna ride with Will Smith. But overall, like Will Smith is is in hot water. A lot of people are like, we don't fuck with Will Smith anymore. It's not like that happened and then he went and shot a movie about being an enslaved person to sort of, my friend used the word debase when she described it. She saw a part of the film at CBC um, and she was like, I walked in late. It was two particularly rough scenes. She said, why is Will Smith debasing himself this way? So just for clarity, the film was shot before the Oscars. It's not like the Oscars happened and then he was like, oh, let me play an enslaved person so that white people can see me downtrodden and they can see that I'm like, you know, put back in my place and then they will love me again. The timing makes it look like that, but it's actually not how the events happen. Whatever happened at the Oscars, this film was always going to be released after Will Smith won. That said, I hate the timing of this shit. 
One of the things that I actually appreciated about Will Smith, because I told you I, I started to miss Will Smith at one point after the Oscars and like he went away and then he wasn't on Instagram. Like I enjoyed him being on Instagram. White people were just kind of like dragging the whole incident. And I was like, look, what he did was bad. I don't condone it. I kind of understand it. But yet, like, I understand that you can't just get on stage and like slap the fuck out of somebody. Th that's a bad thing to do. I recognize that. But like people were acting like Will Smith was Dahmer. Like it wasn't that. Like bring it down to a 10 people. I went on this binge. I started watching all these Will Smith movies on Netflix. Like, Men in Black was on there. What's the one with him and Martin Lawrence? Bad Boys was on there. There was something else. It might have been Wild Wild West. And I was like, I'm never watching that. Like that, there's limits to how far I can go with Will Smith. Sometimes it was exaggerated blackness, but it, it, it went right up to the line of it could be buffoonery, but he didn't cross over. But I appreciated that he was, you know, black hero who saves mankind from aliens. There's always this joke that in order to be popular in Hollywood as a black man, you've either got to play a slave or you've got to put on a dress. I can't remember who made that joke. Maybe it was Dave Chappelle. But it was something that like I noted about Will Smith. He's one of the few that never had to play an enslaved person. There's nothing wrong with taking those roles. If you do it and do it well, if you do it with dignity, you bring pride to your people. Denzel in Glory, I thought he brought dignity to the character. I appreciated that Will Smith never played like an enslaved person. And I think the timing of it now, that it's like this thing happened at the Oscars and, and it's like, okay, well now I'm going to come back in this role where I'm playing someone who's downtrodden and oppressed. It's not that, that confident, self-assured, kind of cocky appearance that Will Smith always has with a lot of roles that he takes. But this one, like, it's, it's not cocky. It's not that self-assured. It's not that confident black man that we're used to seeing Will Smith as. It's, it's, it looks a little broken. Literally, on the, the cover art, cover art, the, the movie art, the, the poster that's circulating everywhere... He's got a shackle around his neck. I, I don't know. I'm going to see it. I'm going to give it a shot. I like Will Smith. I'm rooting for Will Smith. Like I said, the trailer looks good. It looks visually stunning. Will Smith looks like he's, you know, he's, he's done the work. And he's putting on an acting clinic again. It does look like that's what's occurring here. But I still am just a little like enslaved. Will Smith, you're like the king of Hollywood. I don't, I don't know. I don't really want to see Will Smith as enslaved, but I do, but I don't. Do you understand? Does that make sense? <sighs> With HelloFresh, you get farm fresh pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. With HelloFresh, ingredients travel from the farm to your doorstep in less than seven days, so you know they're fresh. Plus, pre-portioned ingredients make cooking a snap and cut down on food waste. Have a packed fall calendar? HelloFresh's quick and easy meals like their 20-minute recipes or low prep and easy cleanup options mean you'll spend less time in the kitchen and more time with loved ones. And what I love most about HelloFresh is they're now offering vegan recipes on the menu every week. Enjoy meals like sweet chili tofu bowls or spicy coconut curry stir fry. I love HelloFresh because it saves me trips to the grocery store and I spend less time in the kitchen. Go to HelloFresh.com slash Ratchet65 and use code Ratchet65 for 65% off plus free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com slash Ratchet65 for 65% off plus free shipping. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. What's the first thing you do when you wake up? Is it checking up on your credit score? Didn't think so. At Chime, that's exactly what they do. With their secure Chime Credit Builder Visa credit card, you can start to build credit with your own money. Chime reports your payments to credit bureaus to help you build credit over time. Their members see an increase of 30 points on average. All of this with no annual fees, large security deposits, or credit checks to apply. I love how easy Chime makes it to improve your credit. So start your credit journey with Chime. 
Sign up only takes two minutes and doesn't affect your credit score. Get started at Chime.com slash Ratchet. That's Chime.com slash Ratchet. The Chime Credit Builder Visa Credit Card is issued by Stride Bank North America, pursuant to a license from Visa USA. Chime checking account and $200 qualifying direct deposit required to apply for the secured Chime Credit Builder Visa Credit Card. Regular on-time payment history can have a positive impact on your credit score. Impact to credit score may vary and some users' credit scores may not improve. Out-of-network ATM withdrawal fees may apply except at MoneyPass ATMs in a 7-Eleven or any AllPoint or Visa Plus Alliance ATM. What else is out? Reasonable Doubt. Everybody and their mother hit me up and was like, are you watching Reasonable Doubt? Y'all know I can't get Hulu over here, even with um, my VPN, which I'm still getting charged for, by the way. I got to call my mother and ask her to cancel my Hulu account. But I was able to watch it on bootleg. (laughs) I watched the first two episodes. It's a really cute show. It gives me Being Mary Jane, but a little more edge which Being Mary Jane came out like over 10 years ago. So maybe it actually did have an edge at the time. But it gives me Being Mary Jane energy, which I I mean in a good way. I don't particularly like the main character, the woman, but I'm intrigued by her and I want to know what she does next. Her husband, McKinley Freeman, is a god among men. I like him more when his hair is low cut. Like I started having a crush on him when he was on Hit the Floor. Remember he played the basketball player? and. But that's when I first started loving him. He's so cute to me. He didn't really do it for me on Queen Sugar. I guess he's currently on Queen Sugar. I'm not watching Queen Sugar. They don't have Charlie. Like, it it just, it didn't do it for me without Charlie. But that's not the point. The point is, McKinley Freeman is cute on this show. I just like his hair a little shorter. But he's married to, like, the main chick. And, like, I don't understand they're married. They're married, but separated. But they go to church together every Sunday, And they show up to all the family events together, even though the family knows that they're not together. And he has video cameras in the house that she knows about and has sex with somebody else knowing that he's watching and he's titillated by this. I was like, I don't I don't understand y'all, too. Michael Ely's on the show. So basically her marriage is never going to be fixed. (laughs) As soon as I see Michael Ely walk into a scene on any show, I'm like, here he come with this bullshit. How are you going to destroy this woman's life? (laughs) Which method will you choose? We know what you're here to do. The man has completely been typecast, but he's so good at ruining people's lives. He's actually very nice. I know him in real life. I wrote this. I wrote essentially what I just said about, you know, Michael Ely ruining people's lives and how fine he is because he's gorgeous on this show. Uh, Episode one, he had cornrows and like a teeny tiny man bun. And I was like, "Mm, it's okay. He showed up in episode two in a fresh suit and a fresh cut. Gold stars all around. But I wrote as much on my page. (laughs) And I forget sometimes that I have like all these damn followers or that people like don't even necessarily follow, but just watch my page or or share it across all sorts of places. But Michael came in the comments. (laughs) It was like, I haven't seen you in a while. See you soon. Something like that. And I was like, oh God, I forget he actually sees my shit. He's the nicest guy. He's genuinely just a really nice guy and has like, no idea how gorgeous he is. And I think he knows that, you know, like I'm an actor and, you know, people must think I'm attractive because, you know, I'm on camera for a living. But I don't think he really understands. That he's like a god among mere mortals. Like, I don't think he really actually gets it. He can't. Just because, like, I know him. He doesn't. Sh- trust me. He just, he doesn't. It's, it's like one of the most humble people I've ever met. And gorgeous on this show. I don't know how he's going to ruin this woman's life, but I know he's going to. That's just... That's that's what's gonna happen. So I'm intrigued. Actually, I think a new episode comes on tonight. I might just stay up and watch it. I'm really trying to figure out who killed that girl. Everybody thinks it's the black guy, but I've watched enough Law and Order to know that it can't be that person. Although, do you remember that show on? I want to say it was HBO. It was Nicole Kidman, and her husband was accused of killing somebody. And just because you know, as we all grew up on Law and Order. So we're just like, oh, it can never be the person that everyone thinks it is. It must be someone else. It was like a little mini series, maybe like six or seven episodes. So you watch all the episodes only to find out like the husband actually did that shit. But it's like from the beginning, it was obvious he did it. We were just expecting it to be somebody else because that's what it always is. 
Maybe the dude actually did do it. I don't know. I'm going to tune in to see though. What else? Do we have an old episode of TV and good black news? I'm actually not mad at that. Oh, okay. So since I'm not in America, right? So I don't catch, I follow all the same sites and accounts and, you know, read all the same news sources that I did back home. So I'm still tapped into everything in the same way. Listeners are pretty gracious and people write in and just like, oh, did you see this? Did you see this? Did you see this? So people make sure that I'm like up to date on things to make sure like I can offer commentary, right? So this is one of those things where I'm just like, do I need to be there to understand? Have I been gone too long and and missing aspects of culture? Because I am like, you know, far overseas on another continent. I'm watching America have a national meltdown over Lizzo playing a slave master's flute. And I'm trying to understand exactly what people are mad about. And when I, by people, I mean actually white people, because I don't think black people are mad. I think black people didn't give a fuck about Lizzo playing the slave master's flute. And initially, I think most people had my initial reaction, which was why she want to play that slave master's flute anyway. But then when they found out white people were really, really upset about Lizzo playing the flute, then it was just like, fuck yeah, Lizzo should play that flute. Just because white people were mad about Lizzo playing the flute. I'm like, did did culture shift in in the not even two months that I've been gone? Because I'm very confused about this flute situation. Lizzo is in D.C. for a concert because Lizzo's been on tour. The Library of Congress is like, hey, Lizzo. Do you want to come to the archives and see some woodwind instruments and, you know, maybe play a few? And Lizzo's like, sure, that'll be fun. Being as how, you know, I'm a trained flutist, a professional flutist, and I incorporate the flute into all of my shows because, again, I am a professional and trained flutist who has been playing a flute for the better part of 20 years. I see why Lizzo would be attracted to the idea of playing this very special crystal flute, which according to my research had never been played before. It was gifted to James Madison, former president, also the creator of the three-fifths compromise. That guy. I get why Lizzo might, you know, ignore all the context about the owner of the flute because it's a crystal flute. This flute is 200 years old. It comes with some razzle dazzle, even though, you know, slave owning three fifths hated your black ass. But but OK, I still kind of get it. It takes a little shine off it for me. But also, OK, it's a crystal flute. It's a historical artifact. And I'm going to be the first person to play it like the flute nerd part of her would be really excited about it. I get why she would want to play the flute. That's not far fetched to me. What I'm trying to understand, what are people exactly mad at? I was reading this article and it had all these takes about Lizzo and this flute and how like it's desecrated and it's disrespectful. I don't know. Like this was like concocted by liberals. Just crazy conspiracy theory shit over Lizzo playing a flute. And I'm like, I really don't think it's that deep. A celebrity was going to be playing in D.C. and the Library of Congress was like, Maybe we could do like a a little PR situation with having her come by. And Lizzo was like, hey, you think I could play it at tonight's concert? And somebody was like, "Okay, sure. Just don't drop the flute. I could see if Lizzo like dropped the flute and then like this, you know, historical artifact is ruined. I could understand that. But she played the flute and twerked. It's, It's Lizzo. That's par for the course. But she plays the flute, twerks. Tells everyone how history is really cool. Isn't history cool? Something like that. Basically, go read, go study, be smart. It's cool to be smart. An implied cosine of music education. Nothing wrong with that. And then she gives the flute back. It goes in its happy little flute case. There's been no reports of damage to the flute. Nothing happened to the flute. Like, what is the problem? Is this really on some like a black girl touched some shit that y'all don't think she was worthy to touch? Is it really like that baseline level of racism? Like black people shouldn't be touching important white things. Is that what it is? I mean, nobody will ever say that, but I'm like, is that what the underpinning of it is? 
One of my friends broke down Little Mermaid because I was like, why are people so upset? It, this can't be about a fictional fish. Like, what is the issue? And my friend broke it down and he was like, essentially, it's like replacement theory. He was like, the same reason that like white people got all upset and like stormed the Capitol. And the idea is that America is browning. White people aren't going to have a place in America anymore. That's what made them storm the Capitol, that fear Chuck D would have said of a black planet, but it's really of a black and brown America. It's freaking white people out. So they do crazy shit. Okay, so you're mad about a fictional fish because literally a black woman has replaced a white cartoon fish. I understand like the, the I mean, it's fucked up logic, but the fear of it all. I understand once you explain it to me like, oh, okay, like that's what the emotional trigger was that makes people react this way. Okay. What is it with Lizzo and his flu? I honestly don't get it. Is this like, I don't know, the slave is touching master shit. Black people are, I don't know, getting too much access. Is that what it is? I'm trying to wrap my head around it. And I really, I don't, I don't, I don't get it. Why she would want to play a slave master's flute? Valid. I've seen people say that he would be rolling over in his grave. Maybe that's what Lizzo wants to happen. Maybe it's just like, that's her way of signifying, like, look at progress. Look how far we've come. This black girl can play this dead white slave master's flute. And he's somewhere in hell rolling around like a pig over a pit, just in agony that this black woman has touched like this thing that was precious to him. That makes sense to me. It was like, is nothing else going on in America that this is an important national conversation? Does Jackson have water? Does Puerto Rico have power? Is Florida dry? Because those pictures were crazy. I was looking at like alligators, crocodiles. I can't tell the damn difference. One of them swimming in people's houses, like swimming through the living room, swimming down the damn street. I was like, Florida is, yeah. There's so much more to talk about. I'm not gonna be able to cover everything today. So that is not everything. I have like a whole bunch of other stuff that we could talk about, including Kanye West walking around in a White Lives Matter t-shirt in a matching shirt with Candace Owens. I'm just, I've avoided talking about his antics as of late. I'm of the opinion that he is in the midst of a full manic meltdown. His recent comments about how he doesn't read and his back and forth with the gap, more public digs at Kim. Because I believe he's going through a mental crisis at the moment that he's not in his full faculties. Doing these things during a mental health crisis doesn't mean that he's not responsible for them. But all of my commentary would just be basically dragging him. And it doesn't feel right to me to drag someone when I don't feel that they're in their right mind. The same thing for Antonio Brown, the football player. He just had an incident in Dubai. He got kicked out the hotel for exposing his genitals and possibly assaulting someone like he put his ass in somebody's face. I don't know where that falls on the, the assault spectrum, but I'm of the belief that he's not in his correct mind either, that he's also having a mental health crisis. So I'm going to just refrain from the commentary on it because it would just be a dragging and it just doesn't feel right to do when I really don't think that they're in a healthy place. We could talk about Joe Budden. I don't know why he got on his podcast and basically admitted to sexual assault, but he did. I'm, I'll save that, I think, for another episode. I really don't have much to say about it other than like, I don't understand how Joe Budden doesn't get canceled. He said and done so much crazy shit and yet keeps a, a massive following. I'm saying this like I'm surprised, but actually shouldn't be. I mean, we watched R. Kelly P on a child on video and he still had like a good another like 15 year run after that like I, I recall correctly he peed on the kid and then chocolate factory came out like a month later and everybody was like step in the name of love and just kind of like forgot about the kid he peed on <laughs> what, what is this conversation that's not everything some stuff I'm holding just so I can wait for the story to shake out a little bit so I'll be back on Friday with an update on Sal Tomei and a bunch of other shit. Okay. Bye.